Hello students, uh, uh, in this module we are going to discuss uh, what is called the kelvin helmholtz instability. It is also sometimes called the shear layer instability. Okay, so let's first understand what is uh, the uh, configuration. Okay, imagine you have two fluids that are flowing. Uh, let's draw a better version. Uh, imagine you have uh, two fluids that are flowing past uh, each other like this. Okay, and uh, the second fluid is flowing with a different velocity. Okay. Now, now imagine that how this can happen. You may have what is called a splitter plate. You have a rigid plate, okay, and fluids with two different velocities are coming in contact, and then eventually they'll form what is called a shear layer right the velocity will be more here the velocity will be less here and uh, there will be a continuous variation of velocity now this has been simplified or abstracted as something like this you have okay a plug like velocity profile in one fluid and another velocity profile another uh, plug like velocity in the second fluid and there is a jump in velocity at the interface these uh, fluids are thought to be immiscible in this particular uh, case okay in reality of course uh, i mean there can be two different uh, streams of the same fluid like air and there is a shear layer and there is a gradual variation this has been abstracted like a uh, uh, jump in velocity uh, at the interface. So, this is the model problem. This is the model shear layer and this is the reality okay, where there is a rather smooth uh, uh, rather smooth variation but sharp maybe look it may be like this okay, initially and of course uh, due to momentum diffusion eventually this uh, can appear like this and so on. Okay, but uh, what we are going to look at is what or rather what uh, Kelvin and Helmholtz looked at is this model shear layer with uh, velocity discontinuity. Now, what is the meaning of this velocity discontinuity? Okay, imagine this velocity discontinuity can also be thought of as a vortex sheet. Okay, uh, vorticity omega is del cross v. Okay, it it tells you about the local rate of rotation about a given point in the fluid okay so something like this okay now a line vortex okay imagine is a collection of vortices such that it's a line and it is at all across the line rotation is being in flow is induced like this okay uh, and this is called a line vortex okay and a point vortex is just a, a point okay a line vortex is a collection of point vortex along the line and a sheet vortex or a vortex sheet is imagine having a plane full of uh, vortex sheets okay like this arranged like this parallel to each other on a plane and each of this is going to induce a flow okay in this sense so the net effect of this would be that if i look at it from from this side this is the three dimensional view if i look at it from the uh, edges like this then the net effect would be okay so let me draw it again the net effect would be on above this vortex sheet things are moving in this direction and below this vortex sheet things are moving in this direction so it will be like this below it will be like this if I add a uniform velocity to this uh, configuration then I will get the profile that I have been uh, drawing in the previous uh, uh, instance okay this here okay so the 
shear layer, the idealized shear layer also corresponds to a sheet vortex or a vortex sheet. And the question is, we are asking is whether a vortex sheet can be stable or not. Okay. So that's what we are going to answer using analysis. As usual, let's understand using a simple physical argument. Okay, this is the location of the unperturbed interface. Okay. And uh, uh, so the what uh, this is being threaded by vortex lines. So it's going to move in this direction. Now imagine. Uh, let's now. Okay, draw the unperturbed as a dashed line. Imagine having a sinusoidal perturbation. Okay, sorry about this. Okay, imagine having a sinusoidal perturbation of the interface. Now, fluid above is flowing in the this direction, and fluid below is flowing in this direction. Okay. Now, uh, don't worry about uh, this. Uh, so, we can think of this configuration or you can think of uh, moving in a frame of reference with the mean velocity when this uh, configuration will look like this configuration. So, for the physical uh, understanding, it's easy to think of fluid above the vortex sheet to go in this direction and fluid below to go in this direction. Now, because so, so fluid is moving in this direction. So, because of the motion of so this vort vorticity along this crest of the wave is seeing a convection in this direction so there will be a convection of all this vorticity and there will be a net sense of vorticity accumulation of vorticity in this direction now in the by the same token this vorticity is also convected so there will be a net deficit of vorticity that will lead to a flow in the opposite direction okay Okay, I'm sorry, the opposite direction. Okay, so imagine what's going to happen due to this uh, convection of this vorticity along the perturbed interface, and uh, wherever there is a negative uh, slope, there is an accumulation of vorticity, and wherever there is a positive low slope, there is a depletion of vorticity, leading to so imagine this extra accumulation of vorticity is also inducing a flow in this direction and in this direction similarly this is going to induce a flow in this direction okay and uh, this right and uh, and this is going to get pushed down whereas this is going to get pushed up okay this leads to an amplification of this perturbed interface and thereby leading to an instability this is the physical uh, meaning of uh, Kelvin Helmholtz instability, which can be understood from the point of view of a vortex sheet. Now, let's imagine uh, drawing a perturbed interface. Okay. Sorry about this. Okay, this is uh, okay. This is the uh, jump in velocity discontinuity, and I'm going to put. Uh, A coordinate frame. This is x into the board is y and perpendicular to the interface is z and uh, let's call these two fluids 1, 2 and uh, this velocity is u2 in the i direction. This is for z greater than 0 and this is u1 in the i direction this is for z less than 0 and the pressure is uh, in the base state is p0 minus uh, rho 2 gz pressure decreases as you go up 
and uh, gravity is acting in this direction and uh, in the bottom side p is p0 minus uh, rho 1 gz okay now this is a vortex sheet at z is equal to 0 okay this is a collection of uh, line vortices as i just uh, told you this is the configuration we want to understand the stability of this configuration let's make some assumptions to begin with the flow is irrotational okay for uh, on both sides of the vortex sheet right and uh, uh, it's also possible to have rotational flow it's not going to complicate uh, uh, the analysis a whole lot but uh, this is the standard assumption made in classical analysis of this problem and the flow is inviscid so this means that the velocity field is written as a gradient of potential so there are two potentials so phi is phi 2 and for uh, the upper surface now uh, of course uh, we are going to perturb the interface okay the perturbation location of the perturbed interface is given by z is equal to zeta of xt okay All right so now z greater than zeta and phi is phi 1 zeta okay so let's use zeta to be consistent and here also let's use uh, zeta and of course zeta is a function of xt this is the perturbed interface so the perturbed interface is denoted by z is equal to zeta of xt okay now we have uh, incompressible flow del dot v is 0 and v is del phi this means that uh, del squared phi i is 0 i takes the label of the two fluids and the bc's are such that v is equal to u1 as z goes to minus infinity and v is equal to u2 as z goes to plus infinity but u1 is del phi 1 and u2 is del phi 2 okay right now because it's an interfacial instability we have to write the kinematic condition okay let z is equal to zeta of xt that represents the uh, perturbed interface okay now let's call this function h of x z t is equal to z minus zeta of x t is equal to 0 as a function describing the perturbed interface now the kinematic condition tells you that d h d t is 0 right so h is nothing but z minus zeta of x t so d h d t is nothing but uh, <coughs> so I have to write partial h partial t plus v partial h partial x I'm going to assume two-dimensional disturbances in the sense that uh, ignore y variations so I'm not going to write the y part here so dh dt is nothing but minus d zeta dt partial h partial t is nothing but partial zeta partial t because z is a coordinate direction plus uh, vx partial h partial x and that is minus partial z partial x sorry partial zeta partial x so this is minus now the third thing becomes vz partial h partial z is 1 so this is simply vz okay this is dhtt okay 
So H is this DHDT is 0. That means Vz is partial zeta partial t plus Vx partial zeta partial x evaluated at uh, z is equal to zeta of xt. Okay, this is the kinematic condition, but uh, this is valid for both the. This is valid for vz uh, one. on both sides of the interface and uh, Vz2 okay now we know that uh, all the quantities are written in terms of potential so we can write partial phi 1 by partial z is partial zeta by partial t plus partial phi 1 by partial x that is Vx1 partial zeta by partial x. Similarly, partial phi2 by partial z that is the second equation here. right? We are writing this equation now is partial zeta by partial t plus partial phi2 by partial x partial zeta by partial x. I am of course ignoring variations in the y direction otherwise you will have terms uh, such as partial zeta, partial y and so on. We are using only two dimensional disturbances here. Now, the pressure has to be obtained from the unsteady Bernoulli equation. Okay, So, this is rho 1 minus partial phi 1 by partial t minus half del phi 1 the whole square minus gz plus C1 is rho 2 minus partial phi 2 by partial t minus half whole squared minus gz plus C2. Now, let us uh, apply this for the base state. In the base state, things are independent of time, and z is zero. That is at the interface. This has okay. This is uh, uh, the equality of pressure at the interface, and I'm assuming zero surface tension because uh, with surface tension you have. Uh, like what we had done in the relay Taylor instability, you have to have an additional curvature term just to save time uh, of writing that and we know how to do that. I am going to assume zero surface tension. So, pressure becomes equal for an inviscid fluid at the interface at the perturbed interface. Okay, So, this is actually at uh, perturbed interface. Okay, Now, if you apply this for the base state, in the base state z is 0. The interface is located at z is equal to 0 and uh, time derivatives are 0. So, what you will get is rho 1 times C 1 minus half del phi 1 is just u 1 is rho 2 because del phi 1 is nothing but uh, partial phi 1 by partial x 1 e 1 plus partial phi 2 by partial x 2 e 2. So, this is 0, this is u 1 and u 1 dot u 1 is u 1 square. Okay, so now we'll introduce perturbations. So phi one is u one x plus phi one prime for z less than zeta. Phi two is u two x plus phi two prime for z greater than zeta. Okay, we linearize now. The governing equations are partial squared phi 1 prime partial x squared plus partial squared phi 2 prime sorry phi 1 prime partial y squared is 0 for z less than zeta partial squared phi 1 prime partial x squared plus partial squared phi 2 prime partial y squared is equal to 0 z greater than zeta. Okay. 
now we introduce uh, disturbances okay oh, we have introduced disturbances and uh, right now uh, boundary conditions are that del phi 1 prime should tend to 0 as z tends to minus infinity del phi 2 prime should tend to 0 as z tends to plus infinity okay now and we also know the kinematic condition the kinematic condition is uh, something that we just wrote uh, here we have to linearize this okay so okay partial phi 1 prime by partial z that is the uh, velocity vz component is partial zeta by partial t plus u1 partial zeta by partial x this is linear because this is the base state okay so you have to understand this partial phi1 by partial x is nothing but partial phi1 base state by partial x plus partial phi1 perturbation by partial x this is nothing but u1 and that's what we are retaining we don't write the nonlinear term partial phi 1 prime times partial zeta okay that is neglected this is linearized okay this is the linearized version of the kinematic condition right so this is one and you similarly have partial phi 2 prime by partial z is plus u2 note that the velocities are different across the interface because the velocities undergo a jump uh, between the two fluids right this is fluid 2 this is fluid 1 and there is a jump at the interface okay this is something that is very very important the velocity discontinuity is very important and you know these are to be applied at z is equal to zeta but then you know because zeta is unknown we Taylor expand about z is equal to 0 and retain only the linear terms if you do this uh, it's easy to see that everything is already the perturbation quantity so the same thing will be applicable at z is equal to 0 as well to linear order there is no non-trivial term that is coming due to the Taylor expansion okay now if you look at the the uh, normal stress or pressure equality right you'll have rho 1 okay partial phi 1 prime by partial t okay now you have plus half del phi 1 the whole squared so let me write this del phi 1 the whole squared is nothing but u1 plus phi 1 prime the whole squared this is u1 squared and this is you have to write half so this is half u1 squared plus 2 u1 phi1 plus phi1 prime squared this is nonlinear neglected this is already cancelled out in the base state okay because you had already applied uh, the uh, Bernoulli equation in the base state so this will get cancelled out so this 2 will get cancelled out to give simply u1 phi1 prime so after linearizing you will simply get from the Bernoulli equation u1 phi1 prime plus g zeta is equal to rho 2 partial phi 2 prime by partial t plus u2 phi 2 prime plus g times zeta now this is all to be evaluated at z is equal to zeta of xt now if you write so I have to write gz okay now if you Taylor expand and uh, you Taylor expand and then retain terms right you will find that uh, this uh, all that will happen is this z will be uh, replaced by z uh, uh, zeta so linearized normal stress balance you could formally Taylor expand uh, or you can say that this is already linear so you simply have to substitute z is equal to zeta 
uh, we had uh, illustrated this in the previous example of Riley Taylor as to how to do this from first principles. So you should look it, uh, uh, look up that module for uh, more details. Here I'm going to just uh, argue that because it's already linear, all you have to do is substitute z is equal to zeta, and that will give you. Uh, and anyway, at z is equal to zero, this is zero. So the only term that will come is simply z is equal to zeta, right? Plus z plus g zeta is equal to rho two. Okay. So these are all uh, linearized about z is equal to zero. We have already done this now. Okay. Now, so we are set uh, with all the uh, boundary conditions and uh, differential equations. So we'll use the method of normal modes. Okay. What you do is you have to expand zeta phi i prime as zeta cap phi i cap times e to the i k x plus s t. Here s is called the growth rate. Different textbooks use uh, different notations. Um, so you should be familiar with all kinds of uh, normal mode expansions. s is called the growth rate. If uh, you write and it can be complex in general if SR, the real part is greater than 0, it's unstable. If SR is less than 0, it's stable. Okay. So, once you substitute this, you will get d squared phi 1 by dx squared minus k squared phi 1 cap 0, d squared phi 2 cap by dx squared minus k squared phi 2 cap is 0. If you solve this, you will get phi 2 cap of y is a2 e to the minus kz plus b2 e to the plus kz and uh, phi 1 cap of y is uh, b1 e to the kz plus b2 e to the minus uh, kz. Now, as that goes to infinity, things should uh, dk for the top fluid. So, b2 has to be 0, otherwise things will exponentially blow up. Likewise, uh, I'm sorry, there is, uh, this is a1, b1, I'm sorry. Let me just rewrite the constants. This is a1, b1. Okay. So, now, as that goes to minus infinity, this term is going to blow up, whereas the disturbance velocity should go to 0. So, a1 has to be 0. So, all you will be left with is just these uh, two constants. So, we have uh, the unknowns are zeta, a1, sorry, a2 and b1. You have three unknowns and you have three homogeneous uh, linear algebraic equations. That is, these are, let me tell you what those interfacial conditions are. You have 1, you have 2, and you have 3. Okay, so we have these three equations and three, uh, so the velocity and three uh, uh, constants, okay, which have to be determined. Note that in the velocity, uh, uh, sorry, the kinematic conditions, okay, these velocities are different because they are on two sides of the vortex sheet, they cannot have the same value. And likewise, even in the pressure continuity, you will see that there is a difference in the velocities. And this is precisely the reason for this instability. Okay. Now, let's write down the velocity continuity. So, what do we have here? Out here, you have partial phi 2 prime, partial p1 by uh, phi 1 prime by partial z. And then you have partial zeta, partial t plus u1, partial zeta, partial x. So, if you do this, if you take the x de z derivative, so you will get, uh, let's say, minus k a2, and then evaluated at z is equal to 0, just gives you 1, right, is equal to, if you re re write the other part of the uh, equation, 
what will you get? This is s zeta plus i k uh, u one zeta is equal to zeta cap to s plus i k u one, and similarly k p one is zeta cap s plus i k u two. Okay, so a two is equal to minus s plus i k uh i'm sorry there is some this is for the second fluid so this should have u2 and this should, the first fluid this should have u1 i have mixed up in that sk i2 uh, uh s plus ik u2 zeta by k b1 is Okay, now finally we have to use the pressure continuity, which is uh, here. Okay, if I do the Taylor expansion, uh, sorry, uh, the normal mode expansion, you will get S V one plus plus. Uh, just give me one minute. Uh, So there is one small thing. Uh, we we wrote when we linearized uh, this particular expression Bernoulli. Uh, see, you have to use this is grad phi. I so I should be so this is grad sorry because the grad operates on entire phi one. But uh, so let me just uh, take a moment to explain this. So half grad of phi one bar plus phi one prime, the whole squared, but grad of phi one bar is u one plus grad phi one prime is simply grad phi one prime. So so you should have u one grad phi one prime u two grad phi two prime. Okay, and. Uh, and because it is a dot product finally you will find that this is simply partial phi u1 prime partial phi1 prime by partial x1 partial phi2 prime by partial x2 see uh, del phi1 is del phi1 dot del phi1 okay so del phi1 is u1 plus partial sorry del phi1 prime plus u1 plus u1 e1 to be specific so this dot product will ensure that only this e1 unit vector will ensure that only partial phi1 prime by partial x1 will come here okay let me just explain this again here for the sake of your uh, benefit so we have uh, del phi1 squared okay this is nothing but del phi1 bar plus del phi1 Prime squared, del phi one bar is u one e one plus del phi one prime. It's just that, and dotted with the same thing. That's the square. That's what the square means. Now, if I dot this with this, I'll get u one squared. Plus, if I dot this with this, I'll get u um, one partial phi one. Let's rewrite this. If I dot this with this, you will get u1 partial phi1 prime partial x. If I dot this with this again, I will get u1 partial phi1 prime by partial x plus a nonlinear term. So this is what will give us to 2u1 partial phi1 prime by partial x. Okay. So if I were to think of this, this has to be therefore u1 partial x. This is u two. Now this will be i k u one phi one prime plus g zeta prime zeta cap is rho two s 
phi 2 cap plus i k u 2 phi 2 prime plus g zeta cap okay <coughs> okay so now one thing that uh, you have to do is uh, instead of uh, this uh, okay so this is uh, where we uh, s plus okay so we can su further simplify let me copy this here copied it here. So, uh, what you have to do next is first you have to understand what is uh, this is zeta cap. Okay, So, zeta cap is nothing but s plus i k u 2 sorry uh, okay let me rewrite this rho 1 times s plus i k u1 phi1 prime plus g zeta cap is equal to rho2 s plus i k u2 phi2 cap plus g okay now what you have to do next is instead of phi1 what is phi1 phi1 uh, evaluated at uh, x is uh, z is equal to 0 is just a2 and instead of a2 you should write this okay instead of uh, b1 you should write this okay so that's what we will do so this is rho 1 what is phi 1 phi 1 is b1 b1 is s plus i k u1 zeta cap by k so another s plus i k u1 whole square zeta cap by k plus g zeta cap is rho 2 here there is a negative sign because uh, a2 is minus of this and phi2 at z is equal to 0 is just a2 so there is a minus s plus i k u2 whole squared zeta cap by k plus g zeta okay now i cancel zeta everywhere it's occurring homogeneously right everywhere i cancel zeta now I'll get an expression for the growth rate s. That's a quadratic equation that has to be solved, right? Uh, so you will get simply rho one g k plus s plus i k u one the whole square is equal to rho two g k minus s plus i k u two the whole square okay right so s can be written as rho 1 u 1 plus rho 2 u 2 by rho 1 plus rho 2 plus or minus k squared rho 1 rho 2 u 1 minus u 2 whole squared divided by Okay, so now if g is 0 or if rho 1 is rho 2, let us take some special case. We have taken rho 1 is rho 2, that means this term is not there. Now, if s is purely imaginary, if u 1 is u 2, the same velocity, then there is s is purely imaginary because this term is also 0. But u 1 is not equal to u 2. That means that there is an imaginary part. That means S has an imaginary part. And the imaginary parts come with conjugate. One is plus and the other is minus. So there is always an unstable mode. So this is always unstable. That is whenever you have a velocity discontinuity like this, this is always unstable. Okay. Now you can ask the question, what if there is both gravity, uh, sorry, density difference and velocity difference? 
then you can find out that it is unstable. It doesn't matter whether in this particular case, in the previous case, doesn't matter whether it's u1 is greater than u2 or it can be like this also. Of course, it doesn't matter because you can always change frame of reference. And regardless of the sign of u1, u2, or which is greater, it is always unstable. Okay, But if rho1 is not rho2, then it's unstable if kg times rho1 squared minus rho2 squared is less than k squared rho1 rho2 u1 minus u2 whole squared. Okay, So this is the uh, result for kelvin helmholtz instability. Now, if rho2 is 0, that is the top fluid is air and u1 is u2 is 0, then we will have what are called surface gravity waves. That is, you have a water body and this is air, this is water and you will find waves. No, Those waves are determined by the frequency of those waves will be determined by this expression under these special conditions. Okay. Now, if u1 is u2 is 0, then we have what are called internal gravity waves. Okay, and uh, these are uh, waves that are found uh, when you have layers of fresh and salt water. Okay, and uh, when rho one is greater than rho two, of course uh, things are stable. Yet you will find that uh, there are waves at the interface which are uh, stable waves. They are not unstable waves. They are stable waves. Okay, and of course uh, you also have Rayleigh Taylor as a special case uh, because uh, you know that uh, when u one is u two and rho one not equal to rho two then you have the Rayleigh Taylor instability when especially when the top fluid has higher density. So this is uh, basically uh, the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. The Kelvin Helmholtz instability is the instability of a sheet vortex as I just told you in the beginning of this uh, uh, module. Right? You have a collection of line vortices on a on a sheet like structure, it's called a sheet vortex that induces flow like this above if the vortices are aligned like this that induces flow like this above and below. Any perturbation leads to uh, accumulation of vorticity here and depletion of vorticity here. Okay, And so this will be like this and this will be like this. This leads to, I'm sorry, let's, okay, if I have any perturbation. So, so here there is a net clockwise vort vorticity, whereas here there will be a net counterclockwise vorticity, both leading to pushing of this interface down and pushing of this interface up. Okay. So this is the famous uh, Kelvin Helmholtz instability, and uh, I'll stop here at this point, and uh, we'll continue in the next model with uh, another instability. Thank you.